or it is a weak argument at best. Both Thomas and Scotus wrote extensive and highly detailed commentaries on various Aristotelian texts. These thinkers and other scholastics call scholastics because of their association with certain schools of thought, such as the Franciscan and Dominican schools, and subsets of these and other schools. The scholastics had a high regard for Aristotle, but contrary to what, somewhat, sometimes, what one sometimes hears, Aristotle was not the final authority for the scholastics in matters of what can be known by demonstration. The final authority in this area was natural reason. The scholastics regarded Aristotle with great respect, of course, <clears throat> but not with piety. Their piety was focused elsewhere. Thomas and Scotus, like the other scholastics, make a sharp distinction between what they think can be known about God on the basis of natural reason and what they think can be assented to only as a matter of faith in response to what they hold to be revelation. Now, these thinkers are, to be sure, motivated to prove that God exists and moreover that his attributes are compatible with what is taught by the Catholic Church. But that they are so motivated does not, certainly not by itself, count against their arguments. A motive should not be misinterpreted as a premise. Euclid may have believed that the base angles of isosceles triangles are equal, and his belief may have motivated him to develop a proof to that effect. <clears throat> but this motive does not invalidate his proof. We have to evaluate Euclid's proof in terms of its premises, and its logical coherence, and the same is true of the proofs of the existence of God that the medieval theologians developed. I mentioned this early on because it is not uncommon to hear. It asserted that we can disregard these proofs because, after all, the men who developed them were already believers. This assertion is based on confusion, if not prejudice. The distinction between what motivates an argument and its actual premises is as elementary a distinction as any in logic. <clears throat> of course, knowing that this or that thinker would like to prove the existence of God that he has an interest in proving the existence of God should certainly alert us to the possibility that his proof might make use of dubious assumptions. <clears throat> but an interest in proving that God exists does not by itself invalidate a proof. Scotus's argument for the existence of God is a modal argument. A modal argument is one that turns on distinctions between possibility, actuality, necessity, and their negations. Here's a brief illustration of modal argumentation and counter-argumentation. This is on the handout that you've got, as are some of the other things I've mentioned. By the way, if you don't have a handout, feel free to just walk out there and get one. It might be easy to follow the lecture or, or look on with someone if it's next to you. Al-Ghazali, a medieval Muslim theologian who takes issue with the heterodox teachings of the Muslim philosophers, makes the following observation, which, as some of you will recognize, reappears in the philosophy of Leibniz. The actual world, the world in which we live, has a certain character. But other worlds differing in various degrees from this world are logically possible. That is to say, there's nothing logically contradictory about the existence of a world like ours, but with, say, a different number of planets, with a few more or few less chemical elements, with different species of plants and animals and so forth. If then there are a number of logically possible worlds, why is this, actual, this world the actual one? Since its mere possibility is not a sufficient condition for its actuality, Al-Ghazali infers that this world exists through the will of God, <clears throat> who freely chooses to make the actual world, make it the actual world, rather than any of the other possible worlds that he could have actualized instead. Of course, one might respond to Al-Ghazali that this world is act the actual world for no reason at all, but this response does not satisfy Al-Ghazali. And it does not satisfy two philosophers who take issue with Al-Ghazali either. One of these is Spinoza, who claims boldly that there are not a number of possible worlds. The only possible world is this one, and if we think that there are other possible worlds, this is due to the extravagancy of our imagination. When we speak of other possible worlds, we do not, according to Spinoza, know what we are talking about. Another thinker who takes issue with Al-Ghazali's argument is the 20th century analytic philosopher, and he is, I think, a philosopher, David Lewis. Lewis agrees with Al-Ghazali, at least with, or at least with Leibniz. Leibniz. Lewis may not have known much about Al-Ghazali. Lewis agrees with Leibniz and he disagrees with Spinoza in holding that there really are a number, indeed a vast number of possible worlds. But unlike Al-Ghazali and Leibniz, Lewis makes the startling claim that all possible worlds exist, really exist. Our world is the actual world only because, according to Lewis, it is the world we inhabit. Lewis regards the word actual as an indexical term like here or now, and its meaning is relative to the speaker who uses it. You are free to laugh at Lewis's thesis of the reality of all possible worlds if you'd like to, but try to refute it. As many have found out, it is not easy to do so. 
according to Lewis, the closest thing to a refutation that his thesis of the reality of all possible worlds has met with is the incredulous stare. Whatever you make of Lewis's thesis, there, there are a vast multitude of possible worlds, all equally real. And whatever you make of Spinoza's thesis, there's only one possible world, and it is this very world, which we call actual. These two diametrically opposed, and I think counterintuitive theses, are a testimony to the power of Al-Ghazali's argument. It can be countered rationally only by theses as extreme or bold as Spinoza's and Lewis's. So much then for the br a brief illustration of modal argumentation. Scotus's modal argument for the existence of God is considerably more subtle than Al-Ghazali's. It is abstruse and considerably more extensive as well, occupying in his treatise on the first principle some 70 pages of concentrated prose and tight reasoning. Needless to say, I can do no more tonight than sketch Scotus's argument. Anselm's so-called ontological argument is in the background of Scotus's argument. Spinoza, hardly a garden variety theist, extrapolates from Anselm's argument as follows, and this is on your hand, I think, too. Of everything whatsoever, a cause or reason should be assigned either for why it exists or why it does not exist. If we grant this proposition, <clears throat> which bars us from saying of anything it just doesn't exist, then we have to ask what kinds of reasons can be given for why something does not exist. As Spinoza notes, these reasons fall into three categories. A, the thing in question has never been brought into existence or produced, for example, a skyscraper of a certain height, higher than any yet built. B, the thing in question was removed from existence or destroyed, example, a Tyrannosaurus rex. C, the thing in question cannot exist because it is a contradiction in terms, example, a square circle. Spinoza thinks that these reasons are exhaustive, not yet produced, destroyed, or a contradiction in terms. Now, Spinoza reasons, if God does not exist, then it must be for one of these three reasons, there being no other reasons for the non-existence that then never brought into being, removed from being, and intrinsically unable to be. If God does not exist, could it be for the first reason, namely that he was never produced? Certainly not, because then God, construed as the greatest possible being, would not be supreme, but would be to some degree inferior to whatever produced him. If God does not exist, could it be for the second reason? Certainly not, <clears throat> because then God, construed as the greatest possible being, would be to some degree inferior to whatever destroyed him. So if God, understood as the supreme being, does not exist, it can only be for the third reason, namely that the very concept God, like that of a square circle, is either a contradiction in terms or is inextricably bound up with the contradiction of self-evident truth. If God does not exist, it can only be because it is logically impossible for him to exist, there being no other reason why he would not exist. But then the following conclusion follows at once like a lightning stroke. If it is possible for God to exist, then he must exist. God's possible existence uniquely entails his necessary existence. Spinoza was not the first nor the last to reach this conclusion. The scholastics accepted it as well, as did the Muslim philosopher, Avicenna before them, who wrote, if it is possible that a, divine be that a divine being exists, this being must exist. Spinoza's extrapolation from Anselm's argument will not be persuasive to those of you who do not think that a reason has to be given for why God does not exist, to those who say God just doesn't exist, period. The thinker who makes much the most interesting case for not having to give reasons for the existence or non-existence of something is Heidegger. <clears throat> At the conclusion of his essay, Nietzsche's expression, God is dead, Heidegger puts it this way, thinking begins only when we've experienced the fact that reason, glorified for centuries, is the most stiff-necked adversary of thinking. I mentioned Heidegger's way of rejecting Anselm's argument here only for the sake of completeness. Note that this way of rejecting arguments for the existence of God has to reject arguments against the existence of God as well, for they too appeal to the authority of reason. Uh, in this connection, I have to say that if you do not respect the, the authority of reason, if you regard it, as Luther did, as a whore, or if you just think, for whatever reason, that reason has nothing to say about the deepest questions the human mind can consider, then there's not much in this talk for you. The express teaching of Aristotle and his great medieval followers, whatever their thoughts about God, is that the principle of non-contradiction and its equivalent principles, such as the excluded middle and identity, are self-evident. If you do not regard these principles as self-evident, but as at best plausible hypotheses, you might still be interested in seeing where reasoning with them leads or does not lead 
as an exercise in following the logos, so to speak. Note that unlike Anselm's argument, that part of Spinoza's extrapolation that I've summarized does not purport to demonstrate that God exists, only that if it is possible for God to exist, then he must exist. If this is correct, and I for one do think it is correct, then everything turns on the question of whether it is possible for God to exist. Perhaps it is not possible for God to exist. Perhaps the concept of God, like that of a square circle, contains a contradiction. Well in advance of Spinoza, the great scholastics detected this unresolved issue in the core of Anselm's argument. Before looking at how Scotus deals with this issue, we need to consider an apparent result of Spinoza's extrapolation. The extrapolation could appear to put the atheist very much on the defensive, for the theist can argue as follows. It is not rational for you to say that God just doesn't exist, period. Given Spinoza's extrapola extrapolation, you must show that the existence of God is impossible. Until unless you can do that, you must concede that his existence is possible. No. But once you've done that, you have to conclude also by virtue of Spinoza's extrapolation that his existence is necessary and not just possible. Now, some theists might regard this argument as decisive, not Scotus, for reasons we shall consider shortly. Consider the following simple but quite ingenious reductio ad absurdum that Scotus advances. A pure perfection, as understood by Scotus, is something that it is absolutely better to have than not to have. And so it is better to have than whatever is incompatible with it. This too is on your, on your um, handout. Now, if there are two incompatible perfections, call them A and B, then one, it is better to have A than B, with which A is by hypothesis incompatible. And yet, if it, two, it is better to have B than A, with which B is by hypothesis incompatible. These two propositions cannot both be true. To belabor the obvious, because A is a pure perfection, it is better to have A than not have A. But because B too is a pure perfection, and hence something it is better to have than not to have, and because having A is incompatible with having B, it is better not to have A than to have it. This is absurd. Hence, if A and B are both pure perfections, they cannot be incompatible with each other. No pure perfection is or can be incompatible with any other pure perfection. The claim that God does not exist because the pure perfections properly attributed to him are in conflict with one another cannot be sustained. If God does not exist, it cannot be for this reason. One could, of course, object that there might still be in the concept of God hidden perfections that are incompatible. But this is just what the above argument has ruled out. The proof of the mutual compatibility of all pure perfections is an a priori argument does not rely on any examples of pure perfections, only on what is meant by a pure perfection. Again, that which is absolutely better to have than not have. In fact, the argument does not even rely on there being pure perfections. All it shows that if there are pure perfections, they cannot possibly be incompatible with each other. But the, speist, the theist might respond in the spirit of Descartes, God is the sum of all perfections. Scotus has just proved that there can be no incompatibility between pure perfections. So has not Scotus proved that no contradiction exists in the concept of God? And if Scotus has done that, has he not proved the possible existence of God and thereby the necessary existence of God as well, given Spinoza's argument? So the compatibility proof could appear to be game, set, and match in disputation with the theist. For many a theist, if he knew of it, this proof would count as decisive. For Scotus, it does not. Scotus tells us what a pure perfection by definition is but does, does not say exactly what things count as pure perfection. Is the ability to create ex nihilo a perfection? Is omnipotence a pure perfection? Is knowledge of what is trivial or base a pure perfection? These things do not seem to be pure perfections for Aristotle, if he even thinks in terms of pure perfections, and many serious thinkers would agree with Aristotle. Moreover, Scotus's a priori compatibility proof demonstrates only that having one pure perfection cannot possibly be incompatible with having another one. But it does not prove that there's a being who has these pure perfections, or even there, that there's a possible being who could have them. How does Scotus understand possibility? He recognizes three distinct kinds of possibility. In the first place, there's possibility in the sense of mere conceivability to us. If, we, if I can conceive of something, it is possible. Scotus thinks that this is too weak a conception of possibility to be serviceable for proof of the existence of God. For one might conceive of something as possible, for example, a triangle with only one of its two angles equal, with all its sides equal, only because one is not conceiving of it clearly enough to detect its contradictory character. 
Similarly, one might conceive of something as impossible only because one does not realize that what appears to be a contradiction can be satisfactorily resolved. For example, Mascota sees it, the Trinity. If the existence of God is conceivable to us, it may be that this is due chiefly to a defect in our conceptual powers. A second sense of possibility that Scotus identifies is, de, identifies is real possibility, real possibility. Something is really possible if there actually exists something that can sooner or later directly or indirectly produce the thing in question. Uh, telephones are possible because they can be produced, and the same is true of many things that have not yet been produced but could be produced later on. This richer sense of possibility can be produced is also of no use in the proof that Scotus wants. The existence of God is not really possible in this technical sense because there is nothing and no one able to produce him, not if he is construed as a supreme being. So Scotus makes use of a third kind of possibility, not merely conceivable to us, and not real possibility in the sense of producible either, but what he calls formal possibility. By formal possibility, Scotus means literally non-repugnance to being. That's his expression. In saying that something is not repugnant to being, and thereby formally possible, Scotus means that it is intimately, even logically, related to what is. From the fact that something actually exists, this lectern, for example, Scotus infers that it is formally possible for such a thing as a lectern to exist. In arguing for the formal possibility of something, Scotus first points to something whose actual existence is manifest and incontestable, like the lectern. He then notes the kind of thing that it is, and from this he infers that such a thing is formally possible. Now, at first glance, this inference from actuality to formal possibility may seem to be about the most vacuous inference conceivable. But as we shall see, it is not vacuous at all. In the posterior analytics, Aristotle lays down several criteria for a demonstration, monapodexis. Scotus accepts these criteria. One of them is that, that to know without qualification that something is, call it X, excuse me, to, one, of the, one of Aristotle's criteria for a demonstration is that to know without qualification that something, call it X, is the cause of something else, Y, we must know not only that X is indeed the cause of Y, but also, as Aristotle put it, puts it, quote, that the latter cannot be otherwise. That is, to demonstrate that X is the cause of Y, Y must be necessary. Or to put it somewhat differently, that Y exists must be a necessary truth. A strict demonstration has to proceed from a necessary truth. That, at least, is how Scotus regards this criterion of Aristotle's. Now, here's the problem. If Scotus is going to try to prove that God is the cause of the world's existence, he must start with a necessary truth. If it is a necessary truth that the world exists, then, as Scotus sees it, the world exists of necessity, and there's no need to seek a cause of its existence that is outside or even above the world. On the other hand, if it is, as Scotus thinks, in fact the case, only a contingent truth that the world exists, then there appears to be no way of meeting Aristotle's criterion that a strict demonstration, hence a strict demonstration of the existence of God, be founded on a necessary truth. Scotus wants to develop not an a priori demonstration of the existence of God, as Anselm attempted, but an a posteriori argument for the existence of God, or demonstration of the existence of God, uh, a demonstration of the existence of God as the first efficient cause, the first efficient cause of the world, indeed the first free efficient cause of the existence of the world, and not just, as in Aristotle, <clears throat> as a final cause. It looks as though Aristotle, simply by insisting that a strict demonstration that X is the cause of Y presuppose the necessary existence of Y, has quite deliberately ruled out a strict demonstration of a first free efficient cause of the world construed as Scotus wishes to construe it as existing only contingently. So what is Scotus to do? If the actual existence of the world is not a necessary truth, then where is Scotus to find the nece necessary premise that according to the crit criterion of the Aristotelians must ground a demonstration properly so called? A lesser thinker would simply ignore Aristotle's insistence that the premise of a strict demonstration be a necessary truth, not Scotus. For he recognizes that if the existence of God can be inferred only from a contingent premise or set of premises, that is, from premises that are not true of necessity, then the existence of God could not be known by us to be a necessary truth. The theist might respond, who cares whether it is a necessary truth or a contingent truth that God exists, that we can prove that God exists is the only thing that matters. Scotus would respond that if all we can prove is that it is contingently true that God exists, then we cannot prove that he exists of necessity. We cannot prove that he cannot not exist. And the necessity of God's existence 
apart from any relation he has to the world, is what Scotus wants to prove. It is his extraordinary integrity that leads Scotus to acknowledge the full scope of the challenge that Aristotle's criterion for strict demonstration poses to any attempt to demonstrate the existence of a first free, efficient cause of the world. Uh, and it is his extraordinary int intellect and imagination that enables Scotus to meet this challenge. Before Scotus, considering how Scotus meets it, let us take a look at the overall structure, not the strategy, that will become clear later. The overall structure of Scotus' argument. <clears throat> The argument is divided into three parts. One, an introduction consisted, consisting of a recondite treatment of different kinds of causality. Two, a lengthy section that attempts to establish the relative properties of God. And three, another lengthy section that attempts to establish the absolute properties of God. The relative properties pertain to the relationship between God and creatures. Scotus attempts to prove that there's a first efficient cause and that there's only one of them. He attempts to prove that there's an ultimate final cause and that there's only one of these. And he attempts to prove that among beings there is one and only one that is preeminent. After establishing that there is one and only one principle that is first in the order of efficient causality, one and only one principle that is first in the order of finality, and one and only one principle that is first in the order of eminence, Scotus then argues that these three are identical. There is one and only one first principle. Scotus then turns to the absolute properties of God, that is, those properties that God would possess even if he had not created the world, the properties that God possesses even if God alone existed, such as intellectuality, which for Scotus includes intellect in the narrow sense, but will, will as well, infinity and simplicity, or non-compositeness. In what follows, I shall focus primarily on Scotus' treatment for a first efficient cause. If this argument is sound, that is, if its premises are true, and necessarily true as well, and if the conclusion follows validly from its premises, then Scotus has indeed established the existence of a unique first efficient cause, and he is entitled to rely on this conclusion in proceeding to the rest of his argument for the existence of God and the properties that are unique to him. The text in which Scotus develops his argument most extensively is translated on the first principle. Scotus, Scotus's title says nothing about God. In fact, he does not refer, refer to the first principle as God until he has established its existence and its primacy with respect to efficient causality, <coughs> final causality and eminence. Scotus thereby, thereby forestalls a question that in some quarters keeps Anselm's argument from getting off the runway. Is God a name or a description? Scotus's first principle is clearly a description. It is not a name. We note also that quarrels or quibbles with Anselm about what he means by greater than are also forestalled by Scotus, along with more serious questions about what we can and cannot conceive solely by attending to the word God. In fact, Scotus does not begin his argument with any statements about God at all. He begins to repeat with the consideration of the nature of causality. <clears throat> Scotus distinguishes between merely accidental causes and what he calls ordered causes. Here's an example, modifying an example of Aristotle's. An example of an altogether accidental cause. A man walks to a swimming pool in order to go for a swim. He happens to meet a debtor once he gets to the swimming pool and he collects the money he was owed. His walking to the swimming pool was not for the sake of collecting the money that he was owed. Nonetheless, in this particular case, the man's walking to the swimming pool for the sake of a swim caused, albeit accidentally, the man to collect his debt. Accidental causes play no significant role in Scotus' argument for the existence of God. I mention them here only because he distinguishes between accidental causes and ordered causes and because he makes a distinction within the sphere of ordered causes between series of causes that are accidentally ordered and series of causes that are essentially ordered. This distinction is crucial to Scotus' argument. An example of a series of accidentally ordered causes, not to repeat accidental causes, accidentally ordered causes, is the series father, son, and grandson. The father is the cause, or rather one cause of the son. He caused the son by begetting him. The son in turn is the cause of the grandson, whom he begot. In this second act of begetting, the son does not rely on the father's act of begetting. That is, the father is not begetting the son while the son is begetting the grandson. Whatever that would mean. The, f <laughs> the father's act of begetting is over and done with. The father may even be dead when the son begets his own son. So in a series of accidentally ordered causes, as Scotus uses this expression, the act of causing, in this example begetting, that is exercised by a posterior or subsequent member of the series does not simultaneously rely on the act of causing exercised by a prior or earlier member of the series. 
Moreover, the members of the series of accidentally ordered causes are all of the same kind, namely men. No one of them is more a man than the other, and no one of them in its causing, begetting in this case, is more perfect in its act of causing <clears throat> than another. The case is different with a series of essentially ordered causes. For example, I'll give an example. Um, just a ah, here it is, my example. It's in my pocket. This pencil is producing. You can't see it, but take my word for it. This pencil, <laughs> this pencil is producing, that is causing marks on a piece of paper. It does so only because my hand is causing the pencil to move. In a series of essentially ordered causes, the lower member, the pencil, exercises its causality only because the higher member, the hand, is also exercising its causality at the same time. In a series of essentially ordered causes, all the causes are simultaneously at work, whereas in a series of accidentally ordered causes, the causes are at work only one after another in temporal succession. Moreover, in a series of essentially ordered causes, the higher causes are more perfect in their act of causing than are the lower causes. My hand is more perfect as a more perfect cause than the pencil, and what causes my hand to move, let's call it my desire for the time being, is a more perfect cause than my hand. Desire can cause a hand to move, but desire can cause a foot to move as well. A hand cannot cause a foot to move, not in the case of walking at any event. In this connection, I note that it is often asserted these days by people who are engaged in the philosophy of science that all causation is successive, that, no causation is the co uh, that, in no that in no causation is the cause simultaneous with the effect. But that cannot be the case, for if the cause must always come before the effect, then there will be a time gap between the cause and the effect. For if there is no time gap between them, then something in the cause is simultaneous with the effect. With the effect. That something is, in fact, the cause qua cause. If, on the other hand, there's always a time gap between everything in the cause qua cause and everything in the effect qua effect, then the cause qua cause has no immediate effect. And the effect, more importantly, qua effect, has no immediate cause. A postulated time gap between cause and effect would render the concept of causation unintelligible, as no less temporally oriented a thinker than Kant insists. So, keeping in mind the distinction between series of accidentally ordered causes and a series of essentially ordered causes, we can proceed to the second stage of Scotus' argument, the argument for the relative properties of God, concentrating on his proof for the, of the existence of a first efficient cause. We know from experience, that is, a posteriori, that something is actually caused. We know this in particular from our experience. I know that my desire to move my hand from our own experience. I know that my desire to move my hand, and thereby the pencil as well, is causative. And I know, moreover, that I move my hand, thereby the pencil, for the sake of something, in the present case to illustrate a point. In Husserlian language, this kind of experience is characteristic of the life world, the ultimate ground from which sciences, such as mathematical physics, abstracts. Because mathematical physics abstracts from such things as human purposes, Though it is able to give an astonishingly impressive account of the material constitution of our world, it cannot fully explain what purposive activity, including the purposive activity of engaging in mathematical science, really is. For any attempt to do so would commit the fallacy identified by Aristotle of appealing to the less evident to account for the more evident. And nothing is more evident than that whatever else is going on in the subhuman sphere of nature, we human beings do certain things for a purpose. So we have a, an experience, a first-hand experience of a series of essentially ordered efficient causes. Now since in this kind of series all the causes are at work simultaneously, the pencil causing the marks on the paper while the hand is simultaneously causing the pencil to move, Scotus infers that there cannot be a progression to infinity in the ascending direction. There must be some efficient cause that is not the effect of a higher cause simultaneously at work in the series of essentially ordered efficient causes. Um, to reiterate, because it is absolutely essential, I'm not talking here about an infinite regress of causes backwards into the abyss of time. That would be a series of accidental causes or accidentally ordered causes, and such a series may well be infinite. Scotus, agreeing with Thomas Aquinas, says we cannot prove that such a series of accidentally ordered causes is not infinite, and so neither, thinks, neither the thinker believes that the eternity of the world can be disproven. But the simultaneity that is characteristic of the essentially ordered series of causes totally, totally precludes there being an unending sequence of causes 
uh, in the ascending direction, all exercising their causality right through the series at an instant. As Scotus puts it, no philosopher has ever said that such a thing was possible, whatever he may have thought about an infinite regression backwards in time. Here's a passage from a recent article on Scotus that puts the matter quite well. It's a quotation. Supplying an infinite number of necessary conditions is not enough by itself to supply a sufficient condition. And this is speaking only about essentially ordered causes, simultaneous. Supplying an infinite number of necessary conditions is not enough by itself <clears throat> to supply a sufficient condition. Consequently, supposing only the regression and caused causes, each member necessary to produce the final effect, but none sufficient, contradicts the actuality of the effect for which, such a, sufficient, for which a sufficient condition is manifestly present. That is Scotus's insight. An objection that such reasoning is a fallacy of composition is mistaken. Scotus is not attributing some feature to the series as a whole solely on the basis of the features of its members, but is contrasting something always missing in each and every member of the allegedly infinite series of essentially ordered causes with something present in the final effect, namely a sufficient condition for being. That's the end of the quotation. In the case of an essentially ordered series of causes, then one of them must be first, a cause that is not an effect, not a member of the series that it is causing. Moreover, this first cause is, as said earlier, more perfect in its causing than any cause lower down in the series. They are all effects as well as causes. Only the first member is a cause that is not also an effect within the series of essentially ordered causes. So we have proved, proven that there exists right here in the actual world a first efficient cause that is not an effect within the series of essentially ordered causes and effects that it is responsible for. This is a truth. However, it is an a posteriori truth. For Scotus, that means it is not a necessary truth, and so as it stands, this truth, that there is actually a first efficient cause, cannot serve as the kind of premise required, according to Aristotle, for a strict demonstration. So the problem that Scotus has set himself still appears to be insoluble, but it is not, for Scotus has an axiom. Though whatever is actual is not necessary, unless you're a follower of Spinoza, though whatever is actual is not necessary, whatever is formally possible is necessarily possible. Repeat that. Whatever is formally possible is necessarily possible. What does this mean? Here's an example. This lectern exists. That for Scotus is a contingent truth, not a necessary one. The lectern need never have been made. But again, it actually exists. Now, from the fact that it actually exists, I can validly infer that it is formally possible for such a thing as a lectern to exist. That is, it is not repugnant to being that a lectern exists. The proposition it is formally possible for such a thing as a lectern to exist is, according to Scotus's axiom, a necessary truth. That it is formally possible for such a thing as a lectern to exist is a necessary truth, according to Scotus. If you take issue with Scotus's action, axiom, you will need to say something like, I grant that this lectern exists, but I don't think it is necessarily possible that such a thing as a lectern exists. Scotus would find that strange, and, and, so, and so do I, but maybe, maybe some of you don't. Note that Spinoza infers from the fact that this lectern actually exists that this lectern must exist. He doesn't make the inference directly. He has reasons for saying that, but that's the character of the relation. He infers from the fact that this lectern actually exists that this lectern must exist. Scotus, on the other hand, infers from the fact that this lectern actually exists that it is necessarily possible for such a thing as a lectern to exist. And I leave it to you to decide which of these is the more plausible inference. For Spinoza, whatever is possible is necessary sooner or later. Nothing that is not necessary is possible for Spinoza. However, we quite naturally say such things as, with respect to the past, I could have done otherwise. With respect to the future, I might do it, but then again, I might not. And with respect to the present, I could be doing something else right now. Spinoza's commitment to necess necess necessitarianism commits him to saying that all these sentences and others of the same type are actually false. False. Indeed, for Spinoza, they're all necessarily false, based on the misunderstanding. Now, to continue with Scotus's argument, just as we can infer by Scotus's axiom from the fact that this lectern actually exists, that it is formally possible for such a thing as a lectern to exist, so we can also infer from the fact that there is an actual series of essentially ordered causes that it is formally possible for a series of essentially ordered causes to exist. And mind you, this statement, it is formally possible for a series of essentially ordered causes to exist, is a necessary truth, according to Scotus's axiom. 
It is to be sure a truth pertaining only to what is formally possible, but again, it is a necessary truth. And so, so Scotus has found the premise for his argument that meets the exacting criterion that Aristotle had laid down. Scotus has proven that in every such series, uh, in every series of essentially uh, ordered efficient causes, there is indeed must be a first member that is not in effect within the series. Scotus has proved that there is in our actual world at least one efi first efficient cause. He infers from the actual existence of a first efficient cause that it is formally possible, not repugnant to being, for a first efficient cause to exist. So what, one might say. This is a, a, this is a step backwards, not forwards. But, but it is a step forwards, not backwards. To see why this is so, let us do a reality check and return to our actual example of a series of essentially ordered causes. That is the example of my pencils, pencil causing the marks on the paper while my hand is simultaneously moving, moving it. I provisionally named this first efficient cause, the first efficient cause in this principle, my desire to cause marks to appear on the paper. But desire is an, adequate, is an inadequate name, for I have desires repressed, suppressed, or just ignores, ignored that do not cause anything at all outside my soul or consciousness, if you prefer. So a better name for the first efficient cause in this example would be my decision to write, to write, make the marks on a paper, that is, an act of my will. Now by will, voluntas, I add it once. I do not necessarily mean, and neither do Scotus and Thomas Aquinas, a free will. The term will designates only a principle of action, a principle of action in a rational being. Whether this principle of action is free or not is quite another matter. My decision to write may well depend on, may indeed be determined by temporally antecedent causes, or it may be determined by a higher simultaneously operative efficient cause, say my intellect's apprehension of the apparent good. In fact, in saying that my will, in an act of decision, moves my hand, I could just as easily have said that my intellect moves it. But something is moving my hand to the end of making marks on a piece of paper. And if the will or even the intellect is in turn caused wholly in part to do what it does in the series of essentially ordered causes, then the series still has to end at a first efficient cause in the ascending order, in the ascending direction. Rather than saying controversially of the series of essentially ordered causes that I've identified right here in the actual world, that not my will but God or an angel moving my will is the first efficient cause, Rather than saying that, I just cut things right here, cut things off right here at the will, and say it's the first efficient cause. The crucial point is that there cannot be a series of essentially ordered efficient causes in the actual world, and such series are to repeat actually met with an experience, unless there is a first efficient cause of whatever sort, unless there's a first efficient cause that is not an effect within the series. My will, again, it's more perfect cause than my hand, if only because it can also create my, cause my foot to move and taking a step which my hand, to say nothing of the pencil, cannot do. And I also note, because it will become important later on, that my will can be the first efficient cause in two ascending series of accidentally ordered causes. I could decide to suspend a yo-yo in the air, even move it up and down with my left hand, while making marks on the paper with the pencil in my right hand. I would not do a good job of either. But clearly I, or more precisely my will, can be an efficient cause in two distinct descending series of essentially ordered causes simultaneously occurring. Now staying with this example, this reality check, check, my act of the will can be taken not only as the top member of an essentially ordered series, the moving pencil example, it can also be taken as but one member, <coughs> as but one member among others in an accidentally ordered series. I am a member of a series of accidentally ordered causes proceeding back indefinitely and perhaps infinitely backwards in time. I had a father, my father had a father, and so forth. But my father, who died many years ago, plays no role in my moving of the pencil right now, nor does anything else I myself did or that was done to me in my youth play a properly causal role within the present simultaneously existing series of essentially ordered causes. Nor does anything that I did or that was done to me yesterday or an hour, or a minute, or a second, or a microsecond, or a millisecond, prior to my actually moving my hand to write right now, play a properly causal role in the simultaneously existing series of essentially ordered causes. Past events do surely play a causal role in the series of accidentally ordered causes, and they can play a merely accidental role as well, but they cannot play a properly causal role in the series of essentially ordered causes because they're past, no matter, no matter how close they are to the present. <clears throat> Consider figure one on the handout. This I think you will want to look at. 
where the horizontal line, one, two, three, et cetera, represents a temporal series of actual causes, either merely accidental or accidentally ordered, where A, which is the same as number five in the horizontal temporal series, is one member of that actual series, and where the vertical line A, B, C, D represents an actual series of essentially ordered causes with A as the first efficient cause, uncaused within that series, and with D as the final cause or any arbitrarily selected effect in the downward series. It would, of course, be possible to argue that just as A could be a member of a temporal series, so could B, C, and D, the other members in the um, series of essentially ordered causes. In that case, our diagram would look quite messy, something like the following. This is your figure two. So you have, you have the horizontal causes, and then A is a member in it, and it causes uh, essentially down to B, but then B has antecedent causes that play some role in its... Uh, um, play some role in the past of B, what comes before B. But because this level of detail does not affect the argument, let's stay with the model in figure one. So A, the first efficient cause in the series of essentially ordered causes A, B, C, D may be in the case of every series of essentially ordered efficient causes that we encounter and experience, both first in the simultaneous vertical series, series and yet not at all first in the horizontal temporally successive series, where we have one, two, three, four, five equals A, and yet, excuse me, and yet in figure one, event one is not causing D, because event one happened a while ago. In the example of my making the marks on the paper, one happened, let's say, a while ago. Uh, it was not uh, several days ago. It is not causing B right now, and for the same reason four in the uh, horizontal series, even if it happened only a millisecond ago, is not playing a causal role within the essentially ordered series A, B, C, D. For four, just like one, is part of the past, just not so far back in the past. Hence, four is not a member, this is important, four is not a member of the simultaneous sequence A, B, C, D. The temporal prior causes of five are, as they say, history. So, even if every first efficient cause, cause of a series of essentially ordered causes that we meet with in the actual order of things turned out to be a member of a temporal series of causes, these antecedent causes can be disregarded in considering the causality at work in the essentially ordered series. In fact, they must be disregarded, for otherwise one of them would be taken as operative in the present when it, in fact, was operative only in the past. So in trying to determine what is causing the pencil to move right now at this very instant, we do not look into the prior history of this event. We disregard the horizontal sequence, one, two, three, four, and we isolate the vertical sequence, the series of essentially ordered causes and effects, A, B, C, D, for consideration. The vertical sequence is so, so isolated is illustrated in figure three on the handout. This disregarding and isolating is fully justified by Scotus' move from actuality to formal possibility. Prescending from actually encountered things such as writing, pencils, pencil marks, and the like, and focusing solely on A, B, C, D, otherwise undetermined, but still as members of a formally possible causal order, we see that nothing about what happens prior to this series of essentially ordered causes pertains to the very concept of such a series. Again, because nothing happening prior to this series is a member of the series. To repeat, because it is essential, and I apologize for belaboring, but it was very essential, it is essential. If four were a cause within the series of essentially ordered simultaneously efficacious causes, it would exist at the same time as five equals A, and that's absurd, for suppose that four is temporally prior to five. Therefore, it is formally possible for A, the first efficient cause of an essentially ordered series, to be entirely atemporal in exercising its causality downward in the series. There is, according to Scotus, nothing contradictory whatsoever about a first efficient cause exercising its causality a priori, uh, uh, atemporally, even if every efficient cause we have encountered in the actual world is also an effect within the temporal series. When we move from the sphere of the actual to the sphere of the formally possible, we recognize that there is no necessary connection whatsoever between being the first member of a series of a series of essentially ordered causes and being but one member among others in a series of accidental or accidentally ordered causes. This is what Scotus, Scotus has discovered. 
And I think it really is a discovery. You may disagree, however. But to keep track of Scotus's argument, you have to grant him, at least provisionally, the following conclusion, again, which you're free to retract later on. An atemporal first efficient cause is formally possible. Now, recall Avicenna's formulation. If it is possible for something to exist that according to its nature cannot be produced, then it necessarily exists. An atemporal, first efficient cause is formally possible, but as atemporal, it is something that according to its nature cannot be produced. Therefore, an atemporal, first efficient cause necessarily exists. With his axioms and with his conception of formal possibility, Scotus has demonstrated the necessary existence of a first efficient cause, exercising its causality entirely outside of time. This demonstration is the basis for everything else that Scotus has to say about the first principle. He does not call this first temporal, this, this atemporal first efficient cause whose necessary existence he has demonstrated God, not yet. <clears throat> he has demonstrated that there's a first principle in the order of essentially ordered efficient causes. Now he has to demonstrate that there's a first principle in the order of final causes, and that there's a first principle in the order of eminence. I shall very briefly sketch these demonstrations. Scotus borrows his argument for a first principle in the order of final causes from Aristotle, again from the second book of, of the Metaphysics. It is a brief reductio ad absurdum. If everything were done for the sake of something else, that is, if everything were a means to a further end, then there would be no genuine end or final goal of activity. But if there were no such end, then there would be no means either. There cannot be an infinite ascension in, uh, in ends or goals of activity. Therefore, there must, Scotus concludes, uh, be a final goal of activity, an absolutely first, an, excuse me, an absolutely final cause. This argument obviously parallels the argument for a first efficient cause, and although this final cause has a teleological effect on temporal beings, it is not itself in time. Note, by the way, that Scotus does not assume that everything in nature operates teleological, teleologically. All he needs to assume is that at least one kind of entity in nature operates teleological, teleologically. Excuse me. It is incontestable that we human beings act, at least some of the time, teleologically. Everything I do, everything you do, is done for the sake of some goal, except, of course, when we do something accidentally, like slipping on ice and falling. Even the little things that one does intentionally or deliberately are done for a purpose, for the sake of something, including things like adjusting one's position in a chair, crossing one leg over another, and so forth. These things are done for the sake of getting more comfortable. We do not typically think about our doing these things for a purpose, but to the question, why did you just reposition yourself in your chair, you can give an answer. And it will take the form of, I did it in order that such and such, to be more comfortable. If a scientist comes up with an elaborate neurological theory purporting to demonstrate that everything we do is just mechanistic, Scotus would say, and Aristotle would say as well, that he is committing the fallacy of explaining, indeed explaining away, the more evident by appeal to the less evident. And furthermore, that he himself is committing this fallacy, which he may not uh, or may not realize is a fallacy, for a purpose. Scotus thinks that simply recognizing that some things in nature are teleological in their operation and reflecting on the nature of such operation requires us to conclude that there's a final goal of teleological activity. But it cannot be teleologically caused, for if it were, it would be caused for the sake of something else and would not be a final goal of activity. From all this, Scotus infers that a final uncaused goal of activity is formally possible. And since it is not caused, more precisely since it is formally possible that such a final cause not be caused, it is necessary as well. A final goal of activity, activity, a first principle in the order of finality, because it is formally possible, exists of necessity. Scotus argues next that if in the actual world some things are more perfect than others, then there must be something that is preeminently perfect. There cannot, be an, there cannot be an infinite ascent in the direction of perfection. What is an example of one thing being more perfect than another? Well, to repeat, my hand is more perfect in its causation than my pencil. A human hand can cause a pencil to make highly intricate and elaborate motions. A pencil cannot cause a human hand to make comparatively, comparably intricate and elaborate motions, and so forth. My will can command, my hand cannot. And again, my will can command my right hand and, and command my left hand to do things simultaneously. In so doing, my will can cause efficiently two sets of subordinate series of essentially ordered causes and effects and can do so for a purpose as well. So Scotus thinks that simply recognizing that some things in nature are more perfect than others and reflecting on the nature of perfection requires us to conclude that something is supremely perfect or unsurpassable. That, excuse me, requires us to conclude that something that is supremely perfect or unsurpassable is formally possible. 
There's no contradiction in that concept. But such a thing cannot be caused, for then the cause will be more perfect than it is. Than it is. A supremely perfect principle is formally possible, and since it cannot be caused, it is necessary as well. A supremely perfect principle, a first principle in the order of eminence, necessarily exists. And let us not forget that Scotus has proven that there cannot possibly be a conflict between pure perfections. That is, between perfections that it is absolutely better to have than not to have. These are the kind of perfections that an unsurpassably perfect principle would have. An unsurpassably perfect principle, a first principle in the cause of eminence, because it is formally possible, exists of necessity. Having proven that there necessarily exists a first principle in the order of efficient causes, a first principle in the order of finality, and a first principle in the order of eminence, Scotus proceeds to demonstrate that these are not three separate principles, but one only. Here is just the briefest sketch of his strategy. If the principle that is first in the order of eminence were not also the first efficient cause, and not the first cause in the order of finality, it would be surpassed to some degree by these two. But the first principle in the order of eminence has been demonstrated to be unsurpassable. By arguing along these lines, Scotus establishes that the three principles are in fact one principle only. The first principle possesses, in comparison with everything else that, can exi that exists, what Scotus calls a triple primacy. Having established that there necessarily exists such a principle, having this triple, triple primacy, Scotus finally calls it God. After having established the relative properties of God, the properties that pertain to how God relates himself to the world, Scotus proceeds to establish his absolute properties. These are the properties that God has and would have even if there were no world. That God has been demonstrated to be the first efficient cause and moreover unsurpassable in his perfection implies according to Scotus that he has intellect. It is more perfect, Scotus thinks that this is self-evident, to, to know what one is doing than not to know. And his first efficient cause, God is doing quite a lot. So God has intellect. And God has will which, to repeat, means simply a principle of acting proper to an intellectual or rational being. This claim, if you accept everything else Scotus has said, is not controversial. But what is controversial, and I would say that it is the great controversy in the dispute between the medieval theologians and the medieval philosophers, is the question of whether God has free will. That is to say, whether God could do other than what he does. Scotus answers this question as follows. It has been proven that God is first in the order of eminence. His will is then perfect. But it pertains to the perfection of the will that it will exist that it will of necessity, excuse me, it pertains to the perfection of the will that it will of necessity, whatever is on a par with it or above it, in the case of beings other than God. And so God wills his own good. God wills his own good, which is on a par with him necessarily. But, Scotus claims, it also pertains to the perfection of the will that it will only contingently what is beneath it. A divine being that could not help but will what was beneath it would not be as perfect as a divine being who was free to do so or not do so, as he so chose. It is formally possible for God to have free will, and having free will is more perfect than not having it. But free will in a perfect being is not producible. Therefore, God necessarily has free will or free choice. He does will what, pertain he does will what pertains to his essence necessarily, but what he wills outside his essence, namely the existence of the world, he wills contingently, freely. Now, because God's will is free, he can will more things than he actually does will. In fact, he can will an infinite number of things. And because of the perfection of his intellect, he knows what these are. From this, Scotus infers that God's intellect is infinite, not extensively, but intensively. That is, his intellect exceeds any finite limit that could be assigned to it. And Scotus argues that the same is true of God's will as well. God's will is infinite, and so is his power. God cannot, according to Scotus, who follows Thomas on this point, will what is impossible, and he cannot will what is compatible with his own perfection, uh, like, to take the favorite example, creating a stone that even he can't lift up. God cannot do this sort of thing because he cannot irremediably limit his own power, and he cannot sin either. To those who worry that this means we can do something that even God cannot do, namely sin, Scotus would reply, as Thomas would, get a grip. The ability to sin or to limit one's power irremediably is an imperfection of power, not a perfection of it. Now, because all God's attributes are intensively infinite, again of such a nature that no finite limit is assignable to them, God himself is intensively infinite, his being is infinite. Furthermore, God is simple, in the medieval sense that he is not composed of parts. For if he were composed of parts, there would be a composer of him who thereby surpassed him in that respect. 
But SCOTUS has already shown that God is unsurpassable in perfection. God's attributes are, SCOTUS says, formally distinct. Here he disagrees with Thomas. For SCOTUS notes that the divine intellect and the divine will can be distinguished in thought by us and by God as well. God knows more than he can will, for some things he knows cannot coexist even through the agency of his will, for their coexistence would entail a contradiction. Such things as uh, the creation and the non-creation of the world. But though God's attributes are formally distinct in this sense, they are not really distinct because, Scotus argues, they cannot exist in separation from or apart from one another. Now, is there more than one God? Scotus argues that there is not by way of an, a reductio ad absurdum, which I abbreviate as follows. God has been proven to exist of necessity through the earlier arguments. God is then a necessary being. Let us assume that there are two such beings, two gods, possessing the properties relative and absolute that Scotus has demonstrated pertain to God. Let us call these two gods A and B. Now, if A has no attribute or property that distinguishes it from B and vice versa, then A and B are not two gods but one only. So let X be an attribute that A has but that B does not have. Now, one, if X is a contingent attribute that A just happens to have, an attribute not bound up with the very nature of A, then X is really distinct from the other attributes of A, and A is not simple but composed, composed of its other attributes plus attrib attribute X, which is impossible since it has been proven to be simple. So A and B cannot differ by virtue of possessing different contingent properties. But if X, the attribute by the possession of which A is presumed to differ from B, is a necessary property, then it is not only formally distinct and not really distinct from the other attributes of A. And that is to say that X is necessarily bound up with the att other attributes that A has. X cannot exist apart from these other necessary attributes. But X does exist apart from B's other attributes, for B, by hypothesis, does not have X. By hypothesis, A and B do not differ from each other by virtue of these other attributes, all of which are necessary, but only by virtue of A's having the necessary attribute X and B's not having it. But if X exists in necessary connection with the other attributes of A, otherwise A would not be simple but composed, and if A's other attributes are identical to the attributes that B has, then X must exist in connection with the other attributes of B as well and cannot exist apart from them. So A and B cannot differ by virtue of one of them having either a contingent attribute or a necessary attribute that the other one does not have. Hence, A and B cannot differ at all but are identical. There is only one God. And that means that God, whose existence in timeless causality Scotus has demonstrated by his modal argument, is the sole, absolutely first principle in every possible series of essentially ordered causes, regardless of how many of them exist, all at once or at different times in the history of the world. So, conclusion. I have said virtually nothing thus far about Scotus's understanding of the creation of the world. I shall uh, conclude this introductory lecture by saying something about it now. But I preface this conclusion with the reminder that Scotus agrees with Thomas that it cannot be demonstrated that the world was created at some point in the past. It is possible to both of these thinkers that the world is eternal. But even if it exists co-eternally with God, Scotus, again in agreement with Thomas, thinks it can be demonstrated to exist at every moment of its existence, whether for only a finite period or for all eternity. It makes no difference, only through the free will of God. Scotus, however, offers an argument that is different from Thomas's, and you will recognize and maybe appreciate its distinctively modal character. Scotus holds that matter is incapable of being an efficient cause, for he understands matter to be merely potential with regard to the forms it can take on or receive. Since matter cannot take on different forms all by itself, an efficient cause distinct from matter is required to bestow form on it and thereby produce or compose complex entities such as trees, dogs, brains, and so forth. As for the contemporary claim that everything is either reducible to matter or produced by matter alone, including such things as the intellect and even the truths that it knows, Scotus would regard this claim as laughable. But many of our learned contemporaries do not regard it as laughable, so let us enter momentarily into their frame of mind. Scotus agrees with Aristotle that space is full of matter, that matter is continuous, and that there are no empty spaces or voids. But post-Aristotelian physics argues that here and there in the actual world, spatial vo voids really do exist, both in small containers from which air has been evacuated and in, con and in inconceivably vast regions of outer space. There are then regions of space, small and great, where matter does not exist. Faced with this scientific claim, Scotus would, I propose, argue as follows. If, in the actual world, matter does not exist everywhere, 
then it is formally possible that matter exists nowhere at all. That is, it is formally possible that matter not exist, period. This formal possibility is sufficient for establishing the proposition that matter is not the necessary being, or a necessary being, let alone that it is the first principle. If matter need not exist, if its existence is contingent, then it actually exists through the efficient cause of something that does not matter. The contingent existence of matter depends approximately or ultimately on the free will of the soul necessarily existing first efficient cause or God. Now, if matter need not exist, then the world itself need not exist. <clears throat> it is formally possible for the world not to exist, but the world, of course, actually does exist. And so it's also formally possible for the world to exist. What this means is that even if the world had never existed, it would have still been formally possible, formally possible from all eternity, that the world exists, for the world to, ex for the world to exist. But in such a case, the world, as merely possible, even as formally possible, could not, because of its very non-existence, bring itself into being. The formal possibility of the world's existence, an existence that is non-necessary, would have depended on, to be really possible, a producer that was not just possible but existed of necessity. But that means that even now, when the world actually does exist, it exists and continues to exist only because it is sustained in its continuous existence by the free will of the soul necessarily existing first efficient cause or God. So what is most distinctive about Scotus's modal argument for the existence of God? It is the movement from what is actual to what is formally possible. And then given the unique nature of the being that is under consideration, the movement from what is formally possible to what is necessary. Thank you.